Accounting Equation and Excel. Add new accounts and the related opening balances. Get ready and some coffee because we're learning the accounting foundation. The accounting equation with Excel. Here we are. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. In Excel, if you don't have access to this workbook, that's okay because we basically built this from a blank worksheet but started in a prior presentation. So if you want to build this entire worksheet from a blank sheet, you may want to begin back there or you can construct your own worksheet from this point going forward or possibly just follow along with good old paper and pencil. If you do have access to this workbook though, three tabs down below. Example, practice, blank. Example, in essence, the answer key, the practice tab, having pre-formatted cells so you can practice the practice problem with less Excel formatting. The blank tab, the one we will be working on is where we started with a blank worksheet but are basically continuing the work within a template, adding to the template as needed as we work through the practice problem. Let's go to the example tab to get an idea of where we will be going, what we will be doing. We're going to be continuing on imagining we're starting our new accounting system with the use of the accounting equation in our Excel worksheet. Imagining that we had some beginning balances, these being those beginning balances from the prior accounting system, which is a common scenario when people start a new company file whether that be using QuickBooks or Xero or any kind of accounting software. They often have started at least a little bit some of their business outside of the current accounting system and are trying to basically upgrade it to a more systemized accounting system. Many times, many businesses have a complete mess of an accounting system in the past and are trying to trim it up given the fact that their business is growing and they need to get this in hand. So... We're going to be focusing in on these beginning accounts that have the most complexity to them because they have the subledgers related to them and then go to the easier types of accounts to put in play, remembering that if these were our beginning balances, we'd like to put them in place as of the beginning of the year. So we have an entire year of temporary accounts, the income statement, so that we can run reports for an entire year from one accounting system and then draw the line as of that point so that the prior accounting system would be used prior to that point in time. If you still have questions and need to go back to that point in time, that's the idea here. We've entered many of the more difficult accounts. The strategy being instead of one large journal entry, we entered them one account at a time taking care to properly get the associated subsidiary ledger. And then the other side went to equity. And so now we're building up our equity one account at a time. And at the end, if all the accounts have the proper balances, the equity or at least the total equity will be correct. And so that's our strategy. So now that we've done the more difficult ones that have the sub ledger, like accounts receivable, accounts payable, and uh, the inventory, we'll go to some of the more easy ones in some ways, like the checking account, although it still has its problems. Those problems being... There's, there's going to be outstanding checks possibly, but just to put it on the books is usually an easier place to start with. So we'll discuss that one. And then we've got the accumulated depreciation and the furniture and equipment, which also have sub ledgers that need to be thought about when putting them on the books. But a lot of times it's a little bit easier to put them just in, in a journal entry onto our accounting system. We'll explain that. And then we've got the visa, which has similar things to the checking account because you can use bank feeds with the visa cards, but it's usually pretty straightforward because it's on a cash based system and usually don't have outstanding transactions for a visa card. And then we got the loan payable, which is spelled incorrectly, I believe, 
but it's usually pretty easy to put on the books, although it also has a sub ledger type of thing, that being the amortization table. So we'll try to discuss all of those as we go here. Kind of got a lot to go through on those last bits. We're trying to combine them into one thing. So let's do it. Let's get into it so it doesn't, so we don't go too long here, man. This is a lot. This is ambitious, being quite ambitious here. All right, so we're going to put on the beginning balance, beginning balance for cash. So we'll put the cash on the books. Now we're going to put the cash on the books at 25,000. The thing I just want to point out as we put the cash on the books is that we're going to have to reconcile the checking account because the checking account is the account that's involved in every other accounting cycle and therefore the reconciliation is our largest internal control. Sometimes with the use of bank feeds, people think that reconciliation is a thing of the past, that you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, we might talk about that more later, but that is not the case. Sometimes the reconciliation will be very easy if you have an accounting system on a cashed basis run through the checking account, meaning you make your books off of the checking account, but you can't always do that. The more accrual components that you need in your accounting system, such as tracking accounts receivable, for example, the more it's not going to be quite that easy to just build your books from uh, bank fee transactions. And even if you were to build your books from bank fee transactions, you still want to double check from time to time with the use of a bank reconciliation to make sure that everything is lined up because it's possible that you have duplicate transactions that came through the bank feeds or that they missed some transactions. The only way to really figure that out is through basically a bank reconciliation process. Now, if you do have a more complex system, such as you're using checks and you might have outstanding checks or you're recording the transactions, not strictly from the bank feeds, but on your side using the bank as a reconciliation feature, which is a more full service accounting system, you might have outstanding checks as of the point in time you're entering your information into the books. In other words, if I was to look as of the end of the year, 1231, we're, we're gonna put that at the same date, our beginning balance on one one, the bank might not have $25,000 in it. It might have something different than that in the bank. Why? Because there's outstanding checks, checks that we knew about, but the bank didn't know about. We properly recorded them. The bank doesn't know about them. That's what happens in a bank reconciliation. We reconcile account for that difference. So that means when we put our stuff on the books, this 25,000 doesn't represent what's actually in the bank according to the bank records, but hopefully is more accurate because we know about stuff the bank does not yet know about the outstanding checks. That means that when I reconcile, however, I'm going to need to know what those outstanding checks are and they're not in this accounting system. They're in the prior accounting system. So that's going to be a mess, but it's not a mess yet. That'll come about when we do the bank reconciliation. So we might talk about that later. So we have to put it on the books for 25,000, even if the bank said like 30,000. Why? Because I need my retained earnings to be the same. I have to put it on the books for what it was on the books as of the end of last year, which we imagine that we closed out, possibly made our uh, tax return from and whatnot. And if there's errors or mistakes in it, I want to make them in the current period going forward, not adjusting the prior periods, which hopefully are already closed. We're saying goodbye to the prior period. I'm not going back to that accounting system unless I get audited or something like that. We're moving forward, making corrections going forward. Hopefully, ideally, that's the idea. Okay, so if I go back on over here, we're going to say this is going to be 25,000. So putting it on the books is straightforward then. We could just say this is going to be equal to 25,000 here. Now, if you did this in accounting software, what's the form? that would increase the checking account. By the way, I'm going to freeze the panes so we can see it a little bit better. Put in my cursor. I'm scrolled all the way up. I'm putting my, my cursor between on cell A4 uh, and then go into the view tab and freeze panes and then freeze the panes so that when I scroll down, the headers are still there and you could still see the headers. Now, what's the form that would be used? Usually a check form. Remember, in the check form is a data input form for accounting software, not necessarily meaning that you wrote a check. Sometimes it might be called an expense form, 
for electronic transfers. A check form having a check number, an expense form does not, but it's the same form, right? Because it's the form that's gonna be used to decrease the checking account. That's the data input form from a software perspective, even if you don't no longer write checks, right? It's basically a check form. All right, but you might call it an expense form even though you might write a check for something that isn't an expense, like you bought an asset. So that term is confusing too. There's all these confusing terms as things are changing, which I'm gonna to try to point out as best I can as we go. All right, so that means that the owner's equity is going up. Hopefully I go the right direction by 25,000. If I don't, that's okay because we have the double entry accounting system to help us out. I'm gonna copy this down as we go. See if I'm in balance, am I in balance? I'm in balance. I can be in balance even when I'm standing on my left leg, man. Cause I've, you know why? It's Cause I've got, I've got good balance. I practice my balance. That's why I can stay in balance even when people are throwing, throwing tomatoes at me. I could still stay in balance. All right, let's go and make this one underlined. Make some underlines here. Underline the bottom line. So no sub ledger is needed, but we will need a bank reconciliation for cash. So we'll keep that in mind, but we'll deal with it later. And so then we're gonna copy this down. Uh, let's copy it down here first. Equals the sum of the last two, the prior balance plus the current activity. We'll copy that across, pasting it just formulas only. Where's my zero here? Zero. Copying it across, pasting it with just the form you lie. And so there we go. And then let's copy down our formula over here to make sure our balance is in balance. It should be because our prior balance was in balance and our current activity was in balance. Therefore the new balance should be in balance. So there we have it. This equals this plus this. Movie B to the N. All right, let's move on to the next one. We're going to imagine it will be uh, the furniture and fixtures. So let's go over here and say now we're on. Let's see if I can color code these. We did the cash. That's done, dude. Cash is done, dude. And then we did the accounts receivable. Why is that doing? Get out of here. Cash inventory. We did that. Inventory's done, dude. Accounts payables done. Do, do, let's just make that a colored. Dishes are done, dude. All right. So now we're going to go to the furniture and equipment. So this is the property, plant, and equipment, the large assets that we put on the books, which even if we're on a cash-based system, we're forced to deviate from that cash-based system, put them on the books as an asset, which makes sense. And the most extreme example is usually if you purchased a building for cash, you wouldn't just expense the building even if you're on a cash-based system because most of us intuitively are like, well, that would mess up the income statement entirely because you can't just have a $100,000 building expense because I bought the building to be used over the next 30 years or so. So it should be an asset, not an expense. Well, the same thing is true for anything in theory that we're buying that we're not consuming at the point in time that we purchased it in order to help us to generate revenue so and even if we wanted to be on a cash-based system for furniture and equipment if you're in the united states system under an income tax code the tax code is going to force you to put it on the books as an asset possibly still allowing you to write it off with us with a accelerated depreciation like a 179 or special but uh, you, you're still going to need to track it that way and put it on the books as an asset. So the other thing that's a problem with the furniture and equipment is that you would think I would need a sub ledger tracking the assets in a similar fashion as we have a sub ledger for inventory. Although the tracking of furniture and equipment should be easier in some ways because the inventory is something that we ha we expect the turnover to be turning over a lot, meaning. We buy inventory, we sell inventory. We buy inventory, we sell inventory. With the furniture and the equipment or any property, plant and equipment, we buy it and then we hold on to it for a long time. Because the cost is high and because we're using it over a long period of time, 
there's not going to be a lot of transactions for the purchase of PP&E property and equipment as opposed to inventory, which we're going to be purchasing all the time, hoping that we're selling a lot of inventory. So that means that the transactions for furniture and equipment are going to be less frequent, higher dollar amount, and they're ones that we're going to have to track so that we can create a subledger. The subledger, however, won't be in QuickBooks typically or in whatever your accounting software is, at least not in the United States oftentimes, because, uh, because the tax code is going to force us to depreciate it according to the tax code, at least for taxes. And that means that we're going to have to have a subledger in the tax software to make sure that we get our taxes correct. And most tax software has the capacity to have both book depreciation, if we want that to be different, and tax depreciation within the subledger. So that means we might as well use the tax software to depreciate typically because we have to use it anyways to do the taxes. That's typically how it works. And so, so what I'm going to do then is mark the fact that I have increases and decreases to furniture and equipment and then tell my tax preparer or use my tax software to record the subledger, which will properly account for the accumulated depreciation, meaning the decrease in the asset as we consume it in theory, expensing the other side in the form of depreciation expense. And then I'll do a periodic adjusting entry into my accounting system to tie out to the tax software. So that means when I put this on the books, what I want to do is contact my tax preparer software people and ask what are the categories of property, plant, and equipment that line up most easily to what's going to be the grouping in the tax software so that I can then make sure that I put my information into the same grouping types of accounts so that I can easily make adjustments with the help and the use of the tax software periodically, possibly yearly, possibly monthly, uh, if needed. Okay, so we'll talk more about that as we go through our practice problem. But the bottom line is, that means that because the subledger is not in our accounting system, oftentimes, because of the difference in depreciation calculation methods that we need to use, I can just do a normal, just easy journal entry, putting the furniture and equipment on the books and the related accumulated depreciation. Now, if there are problems to those, for example, they don't tie out to the subledgers, or you think their grouping is incorrect, then again, what I'd like to do is put it on the books in the same format as is currently in the prior accounting system to make sure that we get the retained earnings that is correct and then make the proper adjustments from there after we get all the books lined up. Meaning I don't wanna make corrections in the prior period and I'd like to get everything lined up so I can see exactly the prior period's conversion to the current period before I start adjusting the current period to fix any any problems uh, in in the current period, right? So that's that's going to be the idea. So therefore, the journal entry is pretty straightforward to put these on the books. All right. So I'm going to go back on over here, and we're going to say uh, this is going to be as of one one. So this is going to be the beginning balance for furniture and equipment. Let's put beginning bow. And, and then I'll make this a little bit larger. Maybe I don't need the whole thing. Okay, and so then this is gonna be 75,000. So that, that's gonna go on the books under an asset of furniture and equipment. Now that furniture and equipment is gonna consist of sofas, chairs and desks and whatnot, which we need to list out individually having the subledger, but again, that subledger hopefully has already been created and is in the tax software and and that's where we can use that's where we can use it so we'll again we'll get into that more later but the other side is going to go to the equity increase in the equity boom shaka laka let's copy the balances down to make sure that remains in balance does that remain in balance the this is going to turn green boom it does Let's put an underline under these. I missed that last time. Underline that I missed last time. And then let's put some zeros across the board. Zeros 
across the board. Zeros. All right, let's put an underline under these. Underline, underline, underline. Okay. And then we'll add the balance after that transaction, which is going to be equal to the sum of the last two prior balance plus the current activity. Copy that. Roger. Roger out. Copy that. Paste in it. Formulas only. And then 10-4. 10-4. Roger that. Pasting it. And then we're going to say, we'll paste it right here. Pasting it. Boom. Okay. Let's copy it down once again. Ultra vez. Copy it down. It's too big. We've got too much cash. Uh, copying it down. Copy this one down to do. All right, let's make this one larger. Okay, so there's, all right, that makes sense. Okay, so we're in balance. All right, and then we're going to do the accumulated depreciation, which is a contra asset account. So the accumulated depreciation, if, so we did the furniture and equipment. If we put something on the books as an asset, instead of expensing it at the point in time we purchase it, then we're going to have to account for the use of that asset over time, the consumption of the asset to help generate revenue, which gives us the expense instead of recording it as furniture and equipment expense or property plant and equipment and expense, we're just going to call it depreciation expense, noting that the furniture and equipment is a little bit more complex than the inventory, noting these two concepts are the same, meaning with the inventory, we buy the inventory, put it on the books as an asset. And then when we use the asset, we give the, the inventory to a customer. We then convert it to an expense of cost of goods sold, expensing it at the point in time we consumed it to help generate revenue, inventory directly going down both in unit and dollar amount. With furniture and fixture, we imagine that they're going to go down, right? That, that the use or the, the value of our couch is going to go down as people sit on it. Every time they sit on it, my couch has been is, is decreasing in value or something. I'll, but it's still just one couch, right? It's not like the inventory is physically going down. So we have to somehow write off the consumption of the furniture and equipment. Usually the way we do that is use time and just say, how long is it going to last and use some kind of time interval to allocate the expense over the use of that time interval, possibly using a straight line method or some accelerated method, given the argument that it's going to be used more in the in the in the current years or the years right after purchase than in the later years. We'll get into those ideas later, but that's the idea of accumulated depreciation, which again we're going to rely on possibly tax software to help us calculate it on a tax basis which we could also use for book basis, although not ideal. Tax software also typically having the capacity to do book depreciation calculations, straight line or double declining or something like that if we want to. But the point is that notice it's on a, it's a credit, meaning it's the opposite of furniture and equipment. This is decreasing the furniture and equipment. You might ask, why don't I just write down the 75,000 by the 7,500 as we consume it, like we do with the inventory. When I use the inventory, we don't make another account called accumulated depreciation inventory. We just write down the inventory. Well, it's because we're telling the reader it's just an estimate. This number is just an estimate. I don't really know what the book value of the furniture and equipment is. I'm estimating the cost, allocating the cost over what I have estimated the useful life to be. Therefore, the difference between these two is the book value of the furniture and equipment, our current property, plant, and equipment accounts. But that's just an estimate. If we were to sell it, we don't really know what's going to happen and, and so on. That, so that's why we broke, we broke this out into its own account, which again adds a level of complexity but gives a little bit more detail to the reader. All right, so we're going to say on 1-1, one, one, we're going to say that this is going to be beginning balance for ACC, let's just call it ACC, 
D pre because it sounds cool. A C C D pre seven thousand five hundred. Now this time it's an asset account, but it's what we call a contra asset account. The contra, the classic contra asset account. So it's a negative in uh, the assets. So there it is. It's going to have a negative bounce. Notice all the other assets could go down with a negative, but none of them will typically have a negative balance. Otherwise, they'd be a liability. But this one, because it's connected directly to furniture and equipment, is going to have basically a negative balance, even though it's an asset, which is weird because it's really the right-hand side of the T account. It's really just part of this. It's part of this account. This account is really part of this account, but we broke it out into its own area because we wanted to give more detail on the financial statements. Like I said, I won't go into it again. You get the idea. So then, own, then so the owner's equity is also going to be going down. Let's copy it down to see if this is making sense. If we're in balance or if I messed up, copying it down, copying it down, see if that red turns green and it does. Boom. Check, check, check. All right. Let's put um, some zeros across the board. Zeros going in, crossing the board with the zero. Oh, not there. Control Z. Undo zeros across the board. Let's put an underline under them, if I may, underline. Hey, hey, if I may. And we'll put an underline under, ba boom. And then we'll do the balance. After that transaction, we'll just sum up the prior balance plus the current activity. Copy that and copy that across. This is where we stand as of this point in time this is where i'm standing pasting it the formulas only pasting it formulas only pasting it formulas only just the formulas just the formulas all right and then let's copy it down one more time see if our balance is in balance assets 115 896 if i add up the last two balance and then balance back in balance that looks good let's put some underlines under like i have this under these put an underline there put an underline here so now we're we're this equals this plus this and we're in balance okay mui b to the n let's go to uh the credit card now uh, is the next one. So if I go over here, we're going to say accumulated depreciation done. Dishes are done, dude. Let's go to the visa card. Now the visa uh, is kind of similar to the checking account in accounting software because you can often use bank feeds for the credit card. But the credit card often is actually easier to track than the checking account sometimes because once again, the most basic checking account if you were completely on a cash based system would be easy to track using bank feeds but any accrual things that get into the mix mess people up mess up the easiness of using bank fees to construct the financial statements accrual things such as having to track accounts receivable inventory accounts payable even the furniture and equipment can mess things up right and so that's going to happen payroll also <laughs> could mess things up so, so, but with the, with the, with the credit cards, normally you're just paying for things uh, that you're consuming at the point in time that you're purchasing it. And therefore you can, you can basically use the bank feeds on a cash based system, even though, you know, you're increasing, instead of decreasing cash, you're increasing the liability but the transactions are usually fairly straightforward. And so, although you still, have to reconcile the visa accounts, the credit card accounts, like we do with the checking accounts. The visa accounts usually are the easiest form of bank transactions, financial statement transactions to reconcile because again, all of the transactions are usually kind of expense transactions and we're recording them on a cash basis in essence or recording them as they happen depending on the credit card statement, bank feeds to record all of them, right? 
So, so that means it's going to be pretty easy to put them on the books and there's not going to be usually any outstanding or difference reconciling items like outstanding checks as there could be with the checking account. So usually putting them on the books is fairly, in other words, this 1000 right there that is on our bookkeeping side is also probably the same number on the, the Visa credit card statement which means there's not any reconciling items that we have to deal with once we go to the bank ricks. So, okay, so let's put it on the books. Pretty straightforward. We're going to say one, one, this is going to be the credit card balance or let's, I'm, I'm messing up my routine. It's beginning balance, beginning balance, bow for credit card. Okay. And it was $1,000. So we're just going to go into the liability section over here. So instead of the checking accounts going down, the liabilities are going up. So Visa credit card, uh, not negative, just equals or plus or whatever, this 1000. And then the other side is decreasing the owner's equity, decrease to the owner's equity. Boom. That's it. Let's copy down the formula to make sure I got those uh, negatives and positives going the right way. So nothing happened to the, to the assets, liabilities going up, equities going up, green zero. Good. Let's put the zeros across the board. We're running long. You got to pick up the pace, pick up the time, man. You're pulling too much time. Okay. I'm going to, we're going to just put this through here because we've seen this before. Let's put an underline here, put an underline here, put an underline here, and then we'll put an underline here. We only got one more after this one. So then I'll say this is going to equal the balance. Pull the balances down, sum up the last balance, current activity, enter, copy that across the board, copy it across the board, pasting it with just the formulas. So we don't mess up our formatting, pasting the formulas, pasting the formulas. All right. One more time. One more round. I didn't hear no bell. I don't stop unless I hear a bell because that's when they trained me like a like a dog because that's when food happens and I didn't hear no bell so I've I ain't stopping okay anyway so now we've got the loan payable so the loan payable usually is fairly easy to put on the books as well if we take out a loan from a bank we, we're going to have issues that we have to deal with that loan because usually when we repay the loan, the most common loan being an installment loan where we pay monthly payments, although business loans might not always be installment loans. But for the example purposes for an installment loan where we pay back monthly payments, similar to like a loan for a car payment or a home payment uh, on a loan or mortgage then it usually includes a principal portion of the repayment as well as a uh, a interest portion that's going to mess up our use of the bank feeds because the interest and principal portions will differ even though the payments are the same which means we might need an amortization table to help us out with that or could use other methods to try to separate the duties between the data input that we want to get from the bank feeds as streamlined and, and automated as possible versus breaking out the interest and the principal, which might be done periodically at the end of the month or the year by ourselves or possibly the bookkeeper with an adjusting entry. That's one issue. Another issue is that the loan payable accounts because the loans are going to be often more than a year in which you have to pay them back, you would expect them to be long-term loans. However, uh, that you have to pay some of it back monthly, let's say. That means that the amount that is due within the next year, by definition, is a current liability as opposed to the long-term portion, which is due after that year's time frame. Now, if you're a small business, you might not care about that as much because you're like, hey, look, I don't need I don't need to do that for taxes because I don't do any external reporting. I'm not reporting like to, to stockholders. I'm a sole proprietorship or partnership. I just want to make sure that I got the loan balance properly recorded and the interest properly recorded for my bookkeeping and for taxes. However, if you do have to do external reporting, say to a bank in order to get a loan or to to 
you know, to investors or partners or something like that, then you're going to have to break out the loan balance into short term and long term portions of the loan to properly account for them on the on the on the books on the balance sheet. Now, to do that messes everything up, though, because once you break out the short term and long term portion, that means every time you make a payment, you should readjust the short term and long term portion as well as break out the principal and interest, which is tedious and not something you typically want to do because on the bookkeeping side, you want to streamline everything, automate everything as much as possible. Therefore, I would suggest that we might want to have one loan balance for each individual loan, possibly breaking out each individual loan into one account and then break them out with an adjusting entry if needed at the end of the period, month or year by us or possibly by the accountant for proper accounting reporting on the balance sheet, breaking out short term and long term, and then convert it back to just one account per loan to account for it internally. The other issue is if I'm going to use one account per loan, do I put that into a short term loan or a long term loan? Now, I often just put it into the short term loan because that's usually easier to, in most accounting softwares because some accounting softwares, you know, they, they have a kind of an issue with putting it into the long term loan and making a, an adjustment to them. So usually I just put it into the current portion of, of the loan, the whole loan into a current liability and then make a periodic adjustment, breaking out the long-term portion. But if you'd rather see all of your loans in the long-term section, you might put them all into long-term and then break out the current portion. The other reason I kind of like it in the current portion is because all loans have a current portion to them, but only some loans have a long-term portion. In other words, if you have a loan that's only six months, it's all gonna be in the current portion. But if you have a loan that's for five years, then you have a loan that has a current and long-term portion. You're not, and it's possible to have a long-term loan without any current portion, meaning you have a loan that is due within five years and you're not paying any installments, but that's not always the case if you're talking about installment. Anyway, that's the thing. Now you might have a situation where your accountant has a whole mess of loans, which again becomes a problem because they might have grouped all the loans together, for example, under one loan payable account, and you'd rather see one loan payable per loan, or they might have long-term and short-term portions of the loan, and you'd like to consolidate them into one account per loan to make it as easy and streamlined to do the data input with bank feeds as possible. So again, what I would typically do is put it on the books as is now, uh, whatever it is, I would put it on the books so that I get the, the, the numbers the same as they were in the prior accounting system. And that will allow me to, if I have to go back, see exactly the tying out, what actually happened, and then make adjusting entries from that point in time to do whatever you need to do. Consolidate the loans into one account, record the proper amount of the loan, making adjustments to interest, hopefully in the current period, as opposed to going back to the prior period, which would mean you would have to redo possibly your tax returns or financial reporting. We're trying to fix things in the current period going forward, not going back to the prior period. If possible, that's the easy thing to do. And so that that's what I would suggest. Therefore, we're going to put it on the books nice and easy here. We're just going to put it on the books as, just like it is on the prior system. And we'll talk more about it later when we start going forward. Balance loan payable. So this is going to be 22000 and I'm just going to put it on. Oh, wait a sec. I didn't copy down the prior balance. Let's copy this down. Don't get ahead of yourself. But I'm almost there. I can see the finish line. Keep the pace. Keep the pace. You're going to trip. You're going to trip if you don't stop. You're losing focus, man. You're losing focus. You got to finish it. All right. Okay. Here we go. So this is going to be uh, the loan payable. So loan payables out here. I'm keeping it in the current liabilities. I'll add a long term later. So we're going to say this is going to be equal to the 22,000. The other side is in the owner's equity negative of the 22,000. Let's copy down the balances to see and make sure that we remain in balance. Copy it down, copy it down, copy it down. The, the red should turn green. It does. Let's bring down the balance. 
putting in first let's put the zeros across the board zeros across the board man this is this is you're pulling too much time i knew i should have broken this out it's okay into two of two presentation it's it'll be okay i can do it in one presentation i don't need two presentations i'm going to say let's make the let's put an underline here and then we'll put an underline here and then we'll put an underline here oh no i italicized it all right and then we'll bring down the balance and then we'll bring down the balance equals the sum prior balance current activity copy that across the board copy paste just the formulas paste just the formulas paste just the formulas copy down the balance to make sure we remain in balance are we remaining in balance this is the moment of truth does that red turn green boom turns green let's put an underline here okay so now we're at 115 asset 115 896 assets liability 38,000 owner's equity, 77, uh, 896. That means that if I was to take assets minus liabilities, it would equal equity, 77, 896, which is in essence the book value of the company. However, remember that I, if I wanted to liquidate the company, I can't just get the 77, 896. This is important to remember. Even when people just talk about rich people, they're like, or if they say like Elon Musk has this much money or Bill Gates has this much money, if they started selling their all of the stuff that they have, they probably wouldn't be able to get that much in cash because, because uh, you know, they might, but it's not that easy because if they started selling stocks, right, the value of the stock would go down. So, so, so notice that if I say the value of the company is 77,896, uh, if I could sell the company, for 77 896 well then then i can recover that but or i could try to sell all of the assets remember if i liquidated the assets i only have twenty five thousand in cash and i have to pay off thirty eight thousand of liabilities at this point in time so how would i liquidate i'd have to sell my receivables or collect on them I'd, and then get the cash i'd have to get my inventory sell that to get the cash at least pulling back cost and then I'd have to sell the furniture and equipment, which I might not be able to get the book value of it, which was 67,500, 75,000 minus 7,500, which would give me the 115,896 in cash. But before I take the cash myself, I should pay the liabilities, which is the accounts payable and the visa and the loan to the bank. Otherwise, they're going to come after me. And then after that, I would be left with the 77,800. Uh, 96 in cash, which I can then take out of the business checking account, give to myself, lowering the cash, zeroing it out, and then zeroing out the equity that would be owed to us. If, of course, it was a partnership, it gets more complex because I would have to pay off the cash to the partners in accordance with their equity balances. And you want to make sure that you do that systematically, by the way, because if you pay off a partner before you've liquidated the company properly, you're going to end up in a mess because you won't have enough cash to pay off the rest of them or something. And, and if it was a corporation, then you're going to have to pay off all, all of the, the shareholders at the end of the day, breaking it out based on the unit share price, which is actually easier than a partnership oftentimes, because that's the point of breaking out the value of the company by share in equivalent kind of units makes it a little bit easier that way.